Raz, dva, tri, aha, tak som zapojená. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's event, which is dedicated to gender equality. So today we are going to talk about the importance of financial independence of women, but not only in relation to maternity leave or pro provisioning of um, uh, oneself or saving for retirement or for any unexpected financial expenditures. No, we're going to talk about position of women in uh, uh, in terms of gender pay gap or payments and wages in general and we'll be talking about investors female investors in Slovakia and position of women in general in this country this event is held by American Chamber of Commerce um, Slovakia under the auspices of the president of Slovak Republic Zuzana Chaputova my name is Lenka Buchlakova I've been dealing with this topic for many years uh, when it comes to gender pay gap, originally as a bank analyst, now also as a moderator and economic journalist. And I can tell you that in the past years that I've been dealing with this topic, I've uh, been exposed to a lot of hatred, even in this, uh, also on social networks. So I even have a feeling I, have, uh, I, I, I deserve to be here. Most recently we had International Women's Day. We were receiving this virtual bouquets of flowers by men congratulating us. So I <clears throat> took the liberty of saying thank you very much for congratulations and I gave them a few pieces of statistical data. And I have to tell you I'm from the East where this is not a topic. And my brother wrote me that I'm only trying to be interesting. And this was my brother, mind you, but you don't really, you can't really explain this to your family sometimes. Nevertheless, we're going to talk about the interesting facts, the statistics, and there are a number of interesting guests today who will tell you more and explain that this is really a very relevant topic in Slovakia. But before we start the panel, I'd like to ask Kristina Godhardova and Zuzana Petrova from American Chamber of Commerce to take over the floor. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. Let me cordially welcome you to the Empower Women Conference from Financial Independence to Sustainable Future. The conference is held by the American Chamber of Commerce of, in the Slovak Republic. We decided to choose this symbolic date of uh, 10th of November, which is the day of gender pay gap, because basically from today until the end of the year, women will work for free. It will take 257 years until these di the differences will be eliminated unless we take active steps. So this is the reason why we also talk to you and, and, and uh, meet here today. Hopefully we will inspire each other to cut this 257 years. We've been dealing with this topic for many, many years and decided to select the topic of financial independence and women. We're very happy that you showed interest in this topic and we'd like to thank Lenka Buchlakova for accepting our invitation to be the moderator and host of this conference. And also we'd like to thank to our inspiring guests for accepting our invitation. Together we'll be discussing why it is important to focus on independent financial independence and women and what changes should be uh, should be taken into account what changes should be implemented so that we fully take advantage of the female potential also we'd like to inspire women not to be afraid to do business and invest because data shows that women tend to be good investors with positive social impact and we are very happy to see also men in the audience and on the stage because only with their participation will be able to implement the positive changes for the whole society at the same time we'd like to thank to the whole team of Amcham and the management of Amcham for giving us space for opening these important topics of course this conference won't be held without the partners of today's conference we'd like to thank to the golden sponsor of uh, today's event Commerci Banca uh, Merka SPP, bronze partners PWC and Zurich Insurance, and media partner Akčna Ženy website. Now I'd like to ask Silvia Porubenova, Executive Director of Slovak National Center for Human Rights, to open this event with her speech. Thank you very much.
Dear ladies and dear gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to open such a conference. And I'd like to thank you for, for arriving here in these difficult times we're going through. We didn't choose these difficult times. And thank you for not resigning to the matters of gender equality. But quite the other way around, you build a very sophisticated event so that it contains all the matters and challenges we are facing. I very much like uh, the fact that we're starting with the topic of financial independence and we will be also talking about sustainable future because for at least 20 years we've been saying that any sort of equality, any sort of freedom and independence for any social group, especially for a social group which is almost a majority as women uh, represent a slight majority of the whole society in Slovakia. Any sort of independence and freedom starts with financial independence. Uh, whether, even, even though if we might believe this is a minor fact or, or, or a minor income, still it is essential to open further questions of justice, freedom and, and fairness. Uh, I have a very good friend of mine and a colleague of mine She's been working in, in the United Nations for many years and in Kiev in the most recent years. And after a dramatic escape from Kiev this year, she decided to resign on her position. And uh, I believe this is not an official um, reason, but as a friend, she told me that she couldn't stand the feeling when her colleagues were sitting in the flats without heating, without lights, without electricity, sometimes even without water, and several times a day they have to hi hide in, uh, in uh, underground shelters. She cannot stand asking them to work for you know, gender equality. And, and, and after a few days I, 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 uh, I thought that perhaps this is not the best idea, because even for these colleagues of yours, these cooperators who have to work in wartime conditions, this is one of the reasons to survive, one of the reasons to persevere, one of the chances to survive. Not only because human rights are, are have never been, you know, given for granted any right, you've always had to fight for it. But if you simplify this you know no problem has ever been solved no opportunity has ever been given to us or any other social group uh, for waiting and being silent so this is also one of the reasons why we cannot vote about human rights you cannot make a referendum about human rights whether the, s the majority believes that some sort of um, minority has a right to anything you know a good example in the conditions of Slovakia or Czechoslovakia, you are very well aware that we've had 100 years anniversary of uh, 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 voting rights for women in the first Czechoslovak Republic. This Republic 100 years ago in 1919 was very progressive because in 1920 there were the first general elections that also uh, included suffrage of, of women. So imagine in this democracy one or two years um, after the, this country was established, there was a referendum. I, imagine there would be a referendum whether men and women w women can vote alike with the men. If we were waiting for that, I, I believe we wouldn't have voting right until this very date. And let me now make a leeway to the you know the difficult times we're going through today. Of course, this applies doubly in the period of cyclical crisis that we're going through. My personal opinion is that uh, we still haven't been fully we still haven't fully emerged from the, all the uh, all the frustration, isolation, fears, and concerns uh, resulting from the COVID-19 crisis. We haven't overcome this crisis yet. We are maybe overcoming it, but we haven't yet. We we don't even have an idea what what will be the nearest future, or whether we'll be able to influence our individual psychology and the the public discourse at present is very vulgar, inhuman, and what is even worse and more dangerous with regards to the policies of uh, public policies, it is without any real content. And talking about the difficult times, we need to talk about the tragedy that happened exactly one month ago, the tragedy in uh, Bratislava, in Zamotska Street, which has a chance to teach us something. It teaches us something that we shouldn't be talking about the difference in our society, but we need to stress the heterogeneity and diversity, because 
we all have various identities. No one of us is just an employee or just a um, just a, a member of a nation. You're not a human with this or that sexual orientation. We all have combination of various identities, and all these identities combine to create a strong potential that we must take advantage of. So even these terrible events that we are facing and we probably will be facing, they must be a breaking point. We shouldn't have others forcing upon us that we are a, a, a black hole of Europe. No, Slovakia is a dynamic country with huge potential. And to remain a dynamic country with huge potential, we need to realize that the, the even the, the, the period of crisis is, you know, f f is, uh, is fighting a chaotic battle. Because if, if we stop fighting that battle, if we say that this is a time for a different agenda, different problems, after the crisis, because the crisis will end sooner or later, after that crisis, we'll be 500 meters behind the original starting lines. The wind will uh, push us back and we must not let the wind to push us back. Hope you will not, I hope that you will not let this wind to, to, to force us, force upon us this regressive, uh, regressive situation and I hope you will find for the better tomorrow. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Borobenova. Now I'd like to ask the panelists, the members of the first panel, so we'll continue with the first, uh, first discussion panel. So could you possibly sit under your photos if you recognize your faces? I, I, I use the face app, so sometimes I don't recognize myself either. So to introduce the panel members, the names are quite large. Nevertheless, let me start with Elena Kohujikova, uh, chairwoman chairwoman of the Board of Advisors of the Prime Minister of the Slovak Republic and Vice Chairwoman of the Supervisory Board of VUB, Sheobecna Uberova Banka, Yulia Chilikova, Executive Director, Supervision and Financial Consumer Protection Department and National Bank of Slovakia, Jana Brodani, Executive Director of the Czech Capital Market Association, morning, Lubomira Lukačova, Manager for Human Resources, Philip Morris International, and uh, to conclude this, the only gentleman in the panel, Martin Schuster, economist and member of the Council for Budget Responsibility. Let's start with you, Ms. Kohutikova. You are one of the most prominent females in the Slovak financial sector. Elena Kohutikova equals money or equals euro, which is good or less. Um, I do believe that throughout your career the journalists and everybody is asking how female uh, fights for her place in this uh, financial world. Uh, I'm definitely not the only one. Um, so what was your story? And is it really that difficult to hold such a position in Slovakia for a female? Very good morning. Thank you for having me over. And okay, let's dive into the topic. What's my story? Well, we are not going to talk about my story because it was uh, full of uh, serendipity and uh, different uh, okay, mm, okay, sort of chances. Uh, and since uh, I was widowed uh, and I stayed uh, and I had two small children, I needed to become a father of the household. Um, so I completely needed to restructure myself, work harder on myself uh, in order to make more money. I have always had a very positive attitude to money, I need to say, and I enjoyed having the money in my purse or at my bank account. So I was really trying hard to get uh, more money, higher pay, and I was always telling my colleagues, well, do as, uh, work as if you had your dream salary. Um, I was 
you know, because we tend to say, okay, you are working only up to your pay, but uh, if you work up to your dream pay, then you will get it. This is my kind of uh, pocket philosophy. And uh, the first um, accident, kind of, or chance what happened was uh, the establishment of the Slovak Republic and I got the responsibility for building part of the National Bank. My boss was older and he was he didn't feel ready to stay as long as uh, it was needed. Since I had my l tough life story or my life story, I wasn't afraid of speaking up. I wasn't afraid to be innovative, and due to my faith in personal arena, I um, was innovative, and I was the first female in the bank supervisory board, and then in the Whoop Bank, uh, I was a vice chairman of the board of directors, and I started to swim in these waters, and I am now the head of the team of uh, advisors to the prime minister, so I am always in this managerial positions, but it needed much more work. Um, we females have kind of a different setup. We need to study things uh, through, need to chew on the things, and only then we utter our opinion. Uh, so I worked harder in order to be able to present at meetings. And in sp uh, on the top of that, females, we have families, so management was crucial. And that's what Martin, who was my colleague, uh, would confirm is that I really had a very packed agenda. I was starting on time, e ending on time, finishing on time, and otherwise I wouldn't be able to uh, work uh, to get the work-life balance. And no matter how strong the of emancipation is, uh, most of the w burden or the family responsibilities are on women. So management is key and especially in the beginning of my career when I want to kind of become the center of attention, uh, when I want to let know that um, I'm well prepared, I need to work harder than our male counterparts. I couldn't ever understand the situation that my colleagues in s the senior positions would open a material at any page and could talk about it for 15 minutes uh, and I uh, know that what they were saying was not in the given document but they were bold enough to say that and we could get inspiration from our men colleagues that we could get this bird's uh, perspective not to be afraid to say what we mm, is believe and what we think is right uh, especially we need to get the techniques uh, the you know the path is there and we need to pursue this path uh, because i believe that women Ha are a great value added to all the teams and are very innovative because they always look for solutions how to get the goal because we have no time to discuss for ages we just need to get to the point how to get to the point how to get to the goal we offer empathy we offer sixth uh, sense and uh, we can see it in the politics uh, that if women are around it's better sometimes it's better uh, than if it is a fully male collective or teams okay you were saying that okay you needed to study harder was there any other barrier save this uh, knowledge barrier and, uh, you know, we keep on hearing those figures, 20% uh, difference uh, I uh, in pay and also lower representation of women at leading positions. And um, men are uh, uh, said to be better managers. You know, I was born under a happy star. I have never had uh, the feeling
that I would be treated differently. I always requested uh, courtesy. Another like story from life. Uh, we had a negotiation, and one of the businessmen uh, used um, not appropriate language, and I told uh, him, and I requested him to go back to decent uh, manners and decent language because the lady was sitting at the table. So I've never uh, encountered something like that uh, that I would be treated differently. For instance. Uh, even when I asked uh, for the pay, but in 1977, when I asked for higher salary, because my male colleagues got uh, higher salary than I did, and I was great, uh, I thought that I was equally good as them, but they turned me down and they went like you could be you could be happy you are here you are female and you have uh, the children so you just uh, be happy that was the only time when i felt discriminated against and i was uh, growing up with two brothers so i really needed to fight for my spot i didn't have problems but you need to be self-confident you need to both personally and also in professional way in order to be convincible in order to really uh, clearly um, show that you deserve the same pay M many times I didn't know what the, was the pay of my colleagues but in National Bank of Slovakia I knew exactly that I had the same pay as my colleagues so there was no obscure uh, situation the transparency there was very very important nobody had hard feelings on anybody that okay you owe more you all earn more than me etc you can ask your questions via slido at all your um handouts uh, there is a QR code that you can scan and ask our panelists. But before you ask your questions, I will. And one more thing, the remuneration. It's a question of uh, corporate culture, but also it's in us as females. I hired many males and females throughout my career. Men always knew how much that position is worth and in the market and asked 20 uh, percent more Ma uh, women didn't have an idea about the pay at the position and usually asked for 40 percent less than in the market and i had a situation when uh, one applicant actually asked uh, lower pay than her potential subordinates uh, we are afraid to we are afraid to fail and we need to do our homework if I you know want some job I need to map the market the positions uh, the financial situation so it's also up to us to take a kind of comprehensive approach uh, and kind of take a fair judgment of ourselves uh, okay what's my value what's uh, Mm, what's my situation w w and it uh, has to do with our ability to so-called sell ourselves okay when talking about remuneration I would like to ask you Miss Lukacheva Philip Morris is one of the two companies that has equal pay certificate and uh, okay so what's the reality of it when I was listening to Miss Kohutikova I, I was just you know rolling my eyes I was speechless uh, the certificate uh, is really for us to carry the message that we are responsible uh, employer that there is not such a situation that women would have a lower pay than men for long uh, corporations have been trying to give same pay to men and women and uh, but there was no proof of it therefore we have decided to certify ourselves by equal foundation this is a swiss organization that uh, cooperates with the uh, university of geneva and price waterhouse coopers uh, that is responsible for audit. We had a huge audit that gave us certification of equal salary. 
and we are very proud to have that certificate because this is a tool for us so when we can prove that yes this is true there's certain statistical tolerance of 3% but we are at the level of 0.1% and at the same time, this was a message. Uh, if there was, uh, for instance, uh, this audit was a message for us that, uh, for instance, uh, if a woman had uh, lower salary because she had spent uh, more time on maternity leave, then it was leveled up. Uh, one third of women uh, sacrifice their career to motherhood and to family. Uh, so how do you a approach uh, the comeback of women from maternity leave. Well, I have already outlined that I well, my message is that it's not only about women to take care of families, but it's up to both of the parents, uh, men for instance. Uh, uh, we really try to encourage our employees, uh, men and women, to go and take care of their families once their children are born. Uh, it's uh, one of the tools we are using is a flexible time, part-time jobs, working on a specific project, not 100% uh, like full employment, and we give them extra time, extra uh, possibility to take um, days off to be able to be with their families. We also try to financially compensate uh, certain situations. So we are trying to create and um, establish an environment to motivate the men and women to come back to work. For instance, working uh, at projects, and I we want them um, to feel fulfilled and respected, so that they don't feel that they suffer because of their fa uh, the, because they have family. Uh, okay, so you're trying to be very vocal about it in the media, in the public space, and this is great, uh, one way or another. How do your employees take those measures and possibilities? Most of our employees have uh, uh, children and have girls, and they are proud, and they really care about the future of their kids and also about the the future of m men and women. So they share it a lot, and we just had the recertification uh, process this year because it needs to be recertified e every three years. And many people said that, okay, I have joined your company, I wanted to work for you because you have a reputation of being fair. And my previous employer has never uh, had never told me whether uh, what kind of a pay do I have and whether there are equal conditions. Uh, so this is a great motivation. Okay, financial literacy is a big thing. Miss Kohutikova, you were saying that females um, don't do the research; they don't know what is the pay on, in the market for that position, and they ask for forty percent of less. Uh, okay, financial literacy. Uh, is uh, very important. We There is maternity leave, we are kind of cut off from the labor market uh, for a couple of years, then our pensions are lower, and this uh, go, you know, is combined with the future uh, and with the situation. But we, there is Jana Brodani, and so maybe she can uh, shed some light on the situation, on the situation in the Czech Republic. Are we better than the Czech Republic, or we are just lagging behind. Thank you very much. Well, I was really laughing about this because I believe that every one of us probably has a lot of these funny and less funny stories. But I'd like to turn this around. Why I started to deal with this question, these are exactly the reasons why you were asking. The first thing is the statistics. And it seemed off to me. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm, I'm an economist, so I kind of understand the figures a little, I make the head or tails of it, and I know that statistics are different, and as we say, I don't believe any statistics that I don't uh, fix myself. So you can take a look at it from various perspectives. The first figure that really st st stroked me, st st striked my eyes, uh, 
the, the, in the Czech Republic they say that the the retired have one of the best positions across the EU when it comes to when it comes to income poverty that they are the least uh, endangered by poverty and then when I looked at the position of women uh, I learned that the women in the Czech Republic's females the retired females in the Czech Republic are the worst have the worst situation across the EU so this was weird so we have relatively good um, retirement pensions compared to other EU countries and now the women are the worst off that seemed off I mean how is this possible so I started to dig deeper and uh, I started to look for you know further data but it still wasn't the major trigger for me to deal with this the trigger came when I went to the negotiation of the retirement commission where there was a table with 15 gentlemen aged 60 plus and they started to brainstorm how we could improve the retirement the pension system and you know how to support the young women to have more children and I was aged around 30 or I was even before 30 so so it was relatively a topic for me even I, I wasn't thinking about having children at that time but and I heard the ideas and they almost agreed that perhaps the best thing to do is to to you know keep the retirement system going by women uh, having more children they by adding them 100 crowns per month to their retirement scheme 100 crowns a month uh, and I was sitting there I was thinking are these guys serious do they expect me that okay now I will have 100 crowns per month more so now I'm going to start having children are they serious so I thought okay now is the time to really join that discussion and start to do something and start to deal with this seriously because statistics are one thing and reality is the other but the situation in Slovakia is very similar to the Czech Republic there are some areas where, where we are doing better some other where we're doing worse but there are parametric differences and the major difference when women are endangered by old age poverty is of course a huge pay gap uh, maternity leave three years for, for, per child and of course the, the setting of the society that the the woman has the you know the second job at home you know this is very similar in Slovakia and Czech Republic and with time there were a lot of the examples that you gradually experience for example when there were in appointees into the boards so the, I, a friends of mine at, at work came to me and offered me the membership in the board and and f I and I thought finally and uh, there was other friends coming to see me Jane they want to name me a member of the board I'm not sure if I should take that and this was repeating one day after another and the male friends was like yeah sure I want to do that and the female friends was like I'm not sure if I'm the one really to be the board member so gradually the situations were you know more and more and more and the biggest trigger for me why I'm so vocal about uh, pay uh, gender pay gap uh, is the fact that I, my daughter was born a couple of years ago and I thought I don't want to work in a way like I'm going to change the world of course not but I work in financial sector and my opinion has certain weight and I'll be very happy to contribute to the situation when in 15 or 20 years time when my daughter starts working even though the children work at 30 now not seriously when when she starts working I don't want her to deal with the same old dilemmas and questions again I want the society to have a different setting so this was one of the triggers maybe the main trigger that after all these experiences last three or four years I really try to push this agenda of uh, pay equality so that our daughters sisters and friends were faring better and after all if we talk about these female issues my female colleagues are so they say well I have no problem I've always worked hard and I've never had a problem with that however when they tell me some anecdotal stories that do not really support this narrative you know that then it all changes and very strong promoters of equal position equal standing of women 
are fathers of children so sorry fathers of uh, who have daughters fathers who have daughters and uh, have a very good experience when it comes to um, violence on women when it comes to setting of the retirement scheme you know um, paying in companies or, or uh, across institutions very strong promoters are fathers who have a daughter or daughters and who imagine this world you know better for their daughters Mr. Schuster, you're sitting next to me. You're nodding your head all the time. It's really you have sons, right? And I really like that. I really like uh, this is a good sample of male population on the stage. But before we come over to you and your presentation, because you wanted to show off, and you are the only one who brought a presentation, yeah, better prepared. You are dispelling the myths of. Uh, the better preparation of um, females versus males. Uh, seriously, talking about financial literacy in Slovakia, we stay in Slovakia, uh, the National Bank of Slovakia project, it's a very timely project also covered in the media, it's, it's a project about financial literacy of, of, of Slovak population, which is very low. And now we're not, not talking about females only, we're talking about across the board, males and females. We're very conservative, not really good investors. Ms. Chilikova from the National Bank, uh, is this project, which is titled Peť Peňazí, that's the name of the project, is this project aiming at the category of women who somehow should, you know, provide themselves, provision themselves for retirement, for un unexpected financial um, expenditures that they cannot cover now yes also women but before I start to talk about that project let me very briefly react to the ladies here in the panel because I, I feel really great here because what you've been saying Ms. Kohutikova and also other ladies number of things that really I, I can really relate to I can relate to it because I got into these manage management positions relatively early on, and uh, when and the story like when, when you had this offering of the position of the financial authority market, there was this you know confusion about naming of the general director, and when they called me, it was, and there were various nominees already you know in the air. The first thing I did was asking all my friends, all my older senior friends, what do you think? Should I take that? Do I have what it takes? So I had to laugh when I heard your stories. Yes, it's true. It's interesting. Women perhaps tend to do this. But why I believe that, now to your question, why I believe that financial literacy and education makes sense and why it relates to, to the topic of today's conference. It is fair thing to say, and I graduated in statistics and the probability theory as a scientist. So when it comes to comprehensive statistics or some, some tangible figures or, or research, we have very little data or very few outputs. And often we, you know, just follow behavioral, behavioral, you know, impressions and you have the the elders meeting in a, in a, in an ivory tower and they do a reform without real figures in their on their hands and i have to say that if you do essential reforms it's important to have facts and not feelings okay we do have some facts but no no optimistic um, conclusions um, result from these facts you know when it comes to figures from 2018 we are under OECD average and also when we did the survey of households mm, it was fatal, fatally low ability to answer essential financial literacy questions and another quantifier perhaps not fully significant from the statistical perspective uh, are the uh, complaints we have uh, complaints department in the National Bank of Slovakia, we have around 2,000s of them. And I'm not going to analyze whether the complaints, uh, whether people complaining were right or not, but over 70% of these complaints are um, unjustified. The client doesn't know what they sign, they don't understand the products, the financial products they were buying. So these are all signals suggesting that we need to do something about financial literacy. 
two years ago we started this project titled Peť Peňazí. We thought like we will not wait for anyone, let's kickstart the project immediately. And we don't believe that we have the exclusive position. We see this project as, as a house with the basics and some partners because there are lots of uh, actions in Slovakia or events like I went to the school I do lectures in two classes and I I say that I'm dealing with you know financial literacy education but it's not enough but it's not enough but I'll come back to that we're talking about how we could uh, achieve you know equal, equal opportunity I'll call this equal opportunity because this is where we should start and equal opportunity starts at the very beginning perhaps all of us in this room we have been very lucky we were born under a lucky star we can be a voice of that those women but uh, we've all had our situations where we were confronted with uh, challenges but we perhaps had the, the luck or energy to go through that and even in the male world we didn't get lost and and I'm very excited that Martin here is sitting here uh, with us ladies I've been working with him for, for many years but so let's let's say who's the most endangered one well leaving out the children but the most endangered groups of population are the vulnerable groups and these are single mothers single mothers because th this is the issue of you know earning money and, and this was one of the motivations for our projects and then female retirees female pensioners female uh, pensioners and why f pensioners we have this uh, longevity and statistically this is a f the figure that is you know grounded in statistics uh, f women live longer but then they start to live alone when they are widowed for example and until very recently I was convinced and I apologize for this because I work with pensions I was convinced that widowers pe w w uh, widow pensions are is something that combines two pensions of two people but but you know these single widows they have to they are dealing with the the, the, the threshold of poverty and this is the argument said by uh, Janka that when they become widows so now leeway to the project we have decided that we need to target all the groups but since we need to capitalize on synergies then we decided to carry out uh, projects uh, with partner organizations uh, who that uh, work with those uh, target groups so we are trying to give those partners know-how and uh, identify partners or companies uh, that uh, have been around for a while and do work for uh, for uh, for some time. Uh, I will be very happy that uh, if you remember that Pet Penazi is trying to uh, land in the financial um, budgets of the project but Pet Penazi also helps as, um, as an idea, as a structure. We cooperate with uh, the organization called Ženi Ženam, Women to Women and we assist the field uh, social workers uh, in gaining uh, financial literacy and then training single mothers. We also work uh, with the Foundation for Single Mothers. And when it comes to young women, and we have um, heard it already, uh, that women need to fight harder. Uh, well, wait, wait, I will then uh, read the questions. Well, you are humble and uh, take it as a benefit. Uh, we have great female trainers uh, that are in part of the program and try to motivate uh, local women to get into the get on board. And we also run a project to get uh, carried out together with this association of pensioners and each um, of the 
target groups uh, communicate in a different way, we need to motivate the female pensioners how to live, what to do, and what really counts is, and what is where it is relatively easy, is to start with children. Children are together, they need to go to schools, um, you know, they are sitting around, and each and every little woman sitting in the school should have the knowledge already. Uh, in the past, uh, men were uh, allocating money to females for households, but uh, this shouldn't be the case. And uh, girls, after leaving school, they should already have the basics of the financial literacy. The first question here was whether you are saving in the second uh, pension pillar, 100% uh, success uh, rate, yes. Uh, but you can still vote, and we will check the results. Uh, and of course, uh, there are some questions that our panelists will answer later on. But now is your time, Mr. Schuster, and time of your presentation. And let's focus on numbers. Not that I would like to forge my statistics, uh, uh, but I have been panicking and I have been really freaking out because uh, I knew whom I would be sitting on panel with. Um, just a quick reaction to the pension system, to panelists have mentioned. This is one of the problems we are facing, that females used to uh, leave for pension and still can uh, uh, sooner for pension, but they live longer. This is extremely unfair, but I, I don't know what to do about it. Uh, our genetic, uh, our genetics is uh, is really uh, failing us, man. And as a result, uh, our females should uh, leave four years later uh, to pension. My grandma uh, who lived 90 years she went to pension uh, at the age of 54 so she was actually longer pensioner than uh, actively working and every single year you live uh, it is minus three percent if we need to really mm, mo modify something on the and change something on the um, on the pension system, then uh, it is this. Uh, well, e I am going to fight for our rights, be sure. And then the pensions will be better every single year uh, You that you go to pension uh, before the set uh, age, then it is minus 3% again. But I wanted to kind of like dismantle this gap between the income between men and women. Okay, the pay gap is about 20%, but the major uh, factor is maternity. So women are not only uh, punished for being women, but also for having children. Uh, women without children earn only 12 to 13 percent less uh, than men, but having children is a main game changer. And this is breakdown by education, and we were trying to look into other factors, type of uh, employment, region, and there is no such major factor as the fact how many children you have. What's interesting that uh, each and every ch uh, child uh, kind of cuts the income, <laughs> whereas with men, the more children they have, the more they earn. It may be because of the division of roles in the family. We give men higher salary because he needs it, because he has more kids. And the female is not asking for higher pay because has a family. 
this is uh, what we need to change. We need to adjust our labor market to how the families with children work. And from the perspective of the employer, it's really not efficient I to employ a, um, a skillful woman uh, and if I also can give her a higher salary. So it seems silly for me that um, that the businesses would discriminate against women, but we need to break through the barriers. And this is um, a comparison of different uh, areas, um, industries. Uh, there are some peculiar results that, uh, for instance, in real estate, women uh, earn uh, almost three times as much as uh, men. And that's only, that's pr most probably because of the fact that many men work only on commission or part time, while women work full time. However, with uh, fixing PCs, uh, usually women take admin uh, roles and then technicians uh, earn three times more than the women. But if we make the division line uh, by skills almost across all the sectors the difference in pay the pay gap is at the level of 20 percent and the the game changer is uh, the number of children and uh, single parent uh, families are complete catastrophe single fathers uh, earn equally or plus two percent but if a, ma a woman is uh, s with a single woman she earns a, s a parent she earns 30 percent less than other women uh, working who don't have children or in other categories and f almost 40 percent less than men so one of the reasons why do we have um, kind of um, um, punishment for uh, parenthood uh, is extremely long maternity leave. Uh, Finland is the leader. We are second in the ranking. Uh, we have uh, father's leave uh, available, but at uh, the length of two weeks only. But still, the length of the parental or maternity leave is much higher, much bigger than um, in other countries. Three years is just way too much. Uh, uh, in between, all other colleagues are promoted, work on their careers, and the women can never catch up. Uh, and in Scandinavian countries, it ha has become clear that uh, if a uh, father is uh, for one year on, on parental leave and also mother on a one, uh, for one year, that, that has no major implications for your career. So one year for mother, one year for father, and then there would be a system of kindergartens, nurseries, then it, this would answer at least half of the problem. When it comes to financial literacy, when I used to work in the National Bank of Slovakia, Julka was mentioning the baseline results. Uh, they are very sad, I need to say, but it's a bit better in men than in women. 50% uh, of men uh, answer correctly the basic questions, while 44% of females only. But uh, there is much higher number of women that say that they don't know uh, answer to the question. But when we make them answer, mostly they answer correctly. So there is kind of like lack of trust in their own capacities. And if we manage to overcome this, women would know it. And this has implication on financial wealth and on managing their own finances. And this is my last slide, um, the results from the study at uh, Info, in, Info Survey in other OECD countries. It, is, uh, it shows that women invest their money more conservatively, 20 to 30 percent of their assets. Uh, in Slovakia it is even less. And... Uh, mm, you 
see that uh, women tend to invest uh, the less likely to own stocks uh, by three or two ten percent comparing to men. This may be explained by lower financial literacy, uh, this lower self-esteem uh, or esteem in or, or trust in their own capacities and they only kind of may uh, answer when they are made to and then naturally women are less prone to risking and uh, we could change the first two um, reasons uh, rather difficult it would be to change the, the risk aversion but uh, still we can do something okay we have seen that the numbers are really not good and the trend is not changing what kind of legislative changes we could adopt in order to move ahead I believe that what's a real key is not the legislative change but long-term work, education, kindergartens and nurseries. It's completely bizarre that there are more than 20,000 uh, turned down applications for enrolling children into kindergarten. How then the females are supposed to work? And we know that children um, four plus uh, benefit from being in kindergartens. It uh, enhances their social skills and when it comes to children age uh, two to four it doesn't seem that uh, it's um, overly beneficial for the kids but it's definitely beneficial for the mother so in return this could be very beneficial for children themselves so we totally need to build nurseries and kindergartens so uh, it will take some time but uh, definitely we should work on it we also uh, should uh, move the age of eligibility when uh, to kindergarten simply must uh, enroll children to kindergartens uh, you know it's uh, it's if uh, it is standard that uh, teachers in kindergarten call mother any time of day that okay your uh, kid is feeling sick come and take it home then it should be available to women uh, to go for the kid pick it up and work from home and also when it comes to the length of maternity uh, we should not force women to take three years of maternity leave uh, in the Czech Republic they have um, they have an option you know uh, the Czech women can choose whether they want to stay at maternity leave for two or three years and then they are paid equally we keep hearing a lot about you know uh, council flats building, especially the one who's suggesting it should be thinking about kindergartens. But we've been dealing with uh, the council flats uh, now. Uh, looking at Slido, do you save for retirement in uh, third pension pillar? 64% says yes, and I also have contributions by my employer as long as you're a full time employee. Uh, Ms. Brodani wanted to react perhaps about the infrastructure. Yes, I think uh, that uh, th th there's been a lot of information for discussion, a lot of food for thought. Uh, two points I have, and, and uh, one of them I can just say and drop the mic. I think we will all agree. First of all, we should be under impression that we're looking for a way how to change women. I think sometimes we do not differentiate between what is inspiration or inspiring and what is you are bad you should do something else you should do something differently. Then one of the questions why we don't look instead of fixed women is, uh, do be more confident and I'm trying to answer both questions at the same time. What I said on my behalf, I hope I'm talking on behalf of, of most women, or at least most women in the panel here, we are trying to turn on the light to women. You know, have you thought about this? You know, it's just like with your health, just like with anything else. I mean, if you don't want to stop smoking, 
for example, you may talk to the person forever. You will not help them. If someone is overweight but they don't want to lose weight, you have no chance to force that person to lose weight. So from our position, we cannot change the system. We not, cannot force women do things differently. But what we can do instead is inspire these women. You know, I'm also a mother. I also thought about having this one-year-old kid. Will I put him into, a, you know, kindergarten? Is it too harsh from me as a mother or not? Uh, so I can inspire young women or young mothers thinking about this, but only inspire. But what I can internally do is think about myself, my choices, and secondly, what, what, what women do, they, they, they sacrifice themselves. I sacrifice myself f so that the child is better off. But I don't want to sacrifice myself. This has two effects. Sacrifice has two effects. First of all, I sacrifice myself. My fa I stay at home, don't care about the money. And, and the person because of whom I'm sacrificing myself, the, uh, that's my child, she would be uh, responsible for me and I'll be dependent on her when I'm old. So the effect is zero. She would have to take care of me. And the second negative effect is that she can see that the mother resigns to her life, to her career, and she follows in my path. And that's double negative. So you need to think for yourself. You alone need to be inspired. You need to uh, need to have this desire. If it's difficult for you to leave uh, your child and go working, well, try to think about yourself as inspiration to your child. You have to have this internal drive, internal motivation, and external Okay, that's clear. It starts and ends with kindergartens. And look at us. Slovakia is a well-developed country. It's, 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 it's incredible that we're talking about the number of places in kindergartens. We should be talking about the quality of kindergartens. I have friends wh who have three universities, three, gr three degrees. They talk four languages and they, and they work for really, really uh, incredible salaries, but still they stayed at home with their children because they want to have the best for their kids. And the discussion, the, the discourse should be about the, the quality of kindergartens, what sort of kindergartens we want to have. But it's incredible that in developed countries like Czech Republic or Slovakia, we're still talking about uh, about uh, the fact wh whether uh, families can pay food for their children in kindergartens. And because this is the, the things that uh, mothers have to think about where so that it's accessible and then whether there are 20 or 30 or 40 children for a single teacher and, and there will be not enough care uh, given to these children that instead of teachers they will be they will be you know um, looking on TV and they will be eating bread and butter the whole day which is cool but not the whole day and all every day so the discourse in the year 2022 or very soon 2023 it's not about the, the, the quantity. It's, it's a shame the discourse should be advanced so that these women have the possibility of choosing quality kindergartens so they don't have to think about whether they will, have a good, they will be given good care, whether the children will be taken care of. The inspiration, France, France is inspiration. I'm sorry for talking too, 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 too much. Uh, I, I mean, I'll say everything that I can leave. I've, I, I've stayed in France for 20 years. Th they have curriculum in kindergartens. It's all done by Montessori education. Their food is approved by the Ministry of Education. It's super quality food so that, that these children learn to eat healthy and eat enough. They had language courses. They have dancing courses. So the mother didn't have to decide whether they will, whether or not they will put their children into kindergarten, but th they were thinking like, it, will my child uh, fall behind if I don't put him or her into kindergarten? So we shouldn't tell women uh, we will cut your maternity leave by one year, but we should support them. We should create the conditions that for the mother it is more convenient to put that child into this care of kindergarten. And then it is simple for her to change that mindset. Well, that it is a good thing to, to start working and leaving the child in the kindergarten. Uh, 
there are a few questions on Slido and I'd like to return to these questions. Uh, some of them have already been answered. One of the questions that you, some of you answered already, that whether we should be, you know, louder, whether this is the right way to be more loud and more assertive. But uh, there are other questions I want to look at. The, there was a question whether the Ministry of um, Labor should take care of that and how they are actually thinking about the problem. And the National Bank, when it comes to uh, financial literacy, is doing something, financial literacy of the population. But it seems that it's rather the commercial sector dealing with this and not the, the, the government institutions. So what would you advise to women who know they deserve higher salary by that they are afraid of rejection? What are the right arguments? Perhaps today uh, the right argument is, you know, the 14% inflation, so you should increase my salary by 14%, right? Ms. Kohutikova? No, probably not. Well, in any case, first of all, the boss should know, we should be able to support the people who are good. I always try to build in my teams to have, you know, a mixed management. So I wanted to have a lot of female directors. And uh, there was a man, my, my employee, uh, and he said, like, I think my results uh, I, for, with my results, I deserve a raise. Maybe, maybe you, you should raise my salary. And that's the simple way to go. You know, usually the boss should have an interview once or twice a year with the employee, and they should also talk about how. You know, the boss should you know give him appraisal or her. Uh, where do you see yourselves? Where you want to go? What you need? Do you need some training? Do you want to take this direction? What what direction? Etc. Etc. So these were the the interviews I was uh, I was conducting with my employees. And naturally, sooner or later, we got also to remuneration, to money. And usually, I was the one to initiate the remuneration question. So it's time to look at your salary. It's time to to talk about what we can do or we cannot do. And some of my female colleagues directors of sections, they asked me, can we talk about money? And I, I, I thought, of course, yes, that's a legitimate topic to talk about in any company. So we somehow arrived to a compromise. And I always ask them, where do you see yourselves in terms of your wage? Uh, and I, she said this and this. I said, well, okay, I can't give you this, but let's agree that this year I'll give you this raise and next year I'll give you that raise. So it was a normal discussion. It wasn't uh, like, I heard that Johnny is earning this and this, I want the same. No, 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 no. You need to be able to, to, to argument what you've achieved, what's your contribution to the business or the company, and this is the reason that you want to have a race. So, if you... I mean, it's, it's a stupid thing not to ask for a race. It's a normal topic for discussion and of course there were situations when uh, there was the uh, exceptional discussion in terms of you know this lady or, or a gentleman uh, who were my employees as they said that they des feel that they deserve a raise because they did some extraordinary you know thing but usually we had this discussion two times a year but it was a complex discussion, the situation in their department, situation in their in their position, uh, uh, situation in the bank, and money was part of it. It was always a relevant part, and we always talked about it. It's a natural thing, it's a natural way of getting to talk about the salary. But the, in my first job, I, I I, I told to my boss, I think I'm doing a great job, I think I have results, you give me more work than the others because you know that I'm a, I'm a good performer, so I think I should get as much money as the others. So I was very direct, very bold, but I used arguments that not a single time he told me that I'm doing a bad job. He always uh, praised me, always you know kept the deadlines. So again, I was, I had an argument of my own professional performance and 
maybe I use the unfair uh, argument like my colleague has been here for this and this amount of time I've been this the same amount of time he's got bigger salary so maybe that's not a best argument but I used it when I was young then you perhaps then you need to be more assertive uh, if, 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 if the boss doesn't want to talk about it but you know you always need to make it a part of a comprehensive appraisal and then you know the topic of salaries is a, is, is, is a natural part of it there are further questions on Slido do you have any experience or do you have any awareness uh, of a gender pay gap 100% uh, participants say yes so everybody's aware of gender pay gap. Uh, Mr. Schuster, you wanted to react. There was a. If if, if we talk about the the, the questions um, from Slido, there's a question for you in particular. Did you take into account in your statistics where of male versus females the number of years? Because if if um, uh, males have more children, they were making career growth, and the women couldn't because she she was at the maternity leave. Yes, exactly, that's the reason. If, if a career of a woman stops for three years or six years, her salary is not growing, or perhaps it may be evaluated for inflation, but she's not advancing, her career slows down, if not stops at all. And sometimes many colleagues, male colleagues, who were who advanced in the meantime, totally you know, escape her from, from her radar. You know? And uh, I wanted to talk about question about being afraid, of females being afraid to ask for a higher salary. It's interesting, males are more afraid of a different sort of rejection. We are afraid when we ask you out for a date, we are really afraid to be rejected, but we're not afraid to ask for more money in, in, our, in our jobs, and it's a normal thing. I also asked Miss Kohujikova when she was my boss and I asked for a higher salary and I didn't receive it, and it was okay for me. And it didn't, it, it didn't uh, destroy our relationship. One year later, she did give me a raise, to be fair. But it happens to me very often, and I have my male uh, employees um, talking to me, and they say they want to have a higher salary. We talk about productivity and performance, and what can be done, what cannot be done. And as long as is within the confines of a standard constructive debate, even though I do not raise the salary, it doesn't destroy the relationships between us. Uh, I mean, of course, there's a situation when they tell me, you give me a raise and I leave. And I if they tell me this, if they if they threaten to leave, then I automatically start to look for another uh, employee. But, you know, you may give them a raise, you may not give them a raise. You shouldn't be afraid of that. And this applies, of course, to males and females across the board. When I had female colleagues, they almost never came to see me to ask for a higher salary. It was quite the other way around. We had regular uh, annual appraisals and then we said, okay, we will give you a raise because you are doing a good job. And It doesn't cost anything if there is a constructive debate. You just uh, should give it a try and maybe you will get a pay a raise or not. Uh, but if you don't... Uh, try it uh, but people uh, but women are afraid especially when they have kids because sometimes they need to leave earlier many women are afraid that if they ask for pay raise uh, pay rise uh, if there is uh, not uh, like very good atmosphere mm, that the the boss will say okay uh, you are leaving earlier your kids uh, get sick etc and they are afraid uh, that uh, the boss will say okay thank you very much for your work uh, but we will um, find somebody else it very much depends on the boss I totally support m mothers I support mothers this is uh, my policy I have hired two mothers in the past six months and I'm trying to help them but when I see that okay female is um, home with her children because they are sick and then she comes back and she tries to catch up I take it as a natural development it so much depends on the boss bosses they need to understand that females have an unpaid job for this society uh, giving uh, 
birth is not an easy job and also women can stay at home for five to six years they l uh, they lose um, kind of assertiveness lose the confidence and that's where the employer needs to be more helpful and encouraging uh, in order to help women to overcome this uh, stage once again i want to reiterate that we we should give uh, an encouragement uh, to each other, women to women, because this fear that, uh, okay, if I ask for a pay rise, uh, they will turn me down. Okay, then I will try something else. Let's uh, give them a chance that they are uh, ready for rejection so that they don't feel under pressure and I would go back to what Yanka was saying that yes uh, we are in 2022 and we keep on reopening the same questions and I do believe that this new generation men would iron their shirts easily and I remember when I wanted to study science at mathematical and physical faculty people were looking at me like are you completely crazy but my parents said okay it's up to you my husband 18 years ago was one of the pioneers and went to pa uh, parental leave for one year because the legislative environment is there but men just won't take it and my daughter plays hockey and you know some ask why does she play hockey well why shouldn't she uh, miss uh, borbenova you were talking about this in the introduction why we are talking about affirmative actions or something or about beneficial treat uh, about preferential treatment everybody should have equal opportunities and i'm not talking only about uh, uh, financial literacy uh, because if you if your purse is empty and you can't get bread for yourself and your kids you don't care about equality but financial training and financial literacy really helps us to become confident and independent uh, as well as we need to accept if a female decides to stay home and just not to work but let's not uh, you know push anybody and let's give everybody chance to pick their own way I really like this n uh, notion that if I am sure that okay I have equal chances and I do feel that that in, in our banks uh, this is the case I have both men and women in my team but I don't uh, but maybe we are just way too lucky my take-home message is that create the, such an environment to have uh, equal chances to set ourselves free from the prejudices because we are just keeping uh, walking in the circles and then we mm, get this polarized attitude I really enjoy somebody being uh, like uh, being polite having courtesy but it's not related to gender but let's really be tolerant okay let's uh, go through the questions. Miss Lukachova uh, was appalled. I've been trying to get pay ra rise for 2.5 years. Uh, this year they wanted uh, to settle with me by giving me severance pay. Um, uh, but I'm too initiative uh, so I wouldn't get it. Uh, so this is completely appalling. This is absolutely inadequate and non-acceptable. And I think that it's very much up to us to push for normalization, for uh, not accepting some things. Some things are just not uh, 
dignified and are not acceptable at all. We were talking a lot about kindergartens, nurseries, but it should be a standard and norm that everybody chips in. All family members, we have uh, uh, our partners, we have our husbands, uh, there is mother, father, or any other d different setting how people raise their children. I really don't like uh, seeing those things happening. My only piece of advice would be to get the severance pay and find another employer where they will really appreciate you and your work. Y many women are in material deprivation in Slovakia, so if they pay all their bills and on all mandatory payments, they actually don't have a uh, decent life. Those are usually single mothers, and we are getting worse in those figures uh, due to corona crisis, so it's not really good. Uh, okay, uh, there was uh, this narrative that women are decided about men. How to change this? Uh, how to convince women that their opinion matters? Well, first, we need data. Under the Project 5 uh, page Penyazi, there is a good example that under one grant we collect together with the University of Economy data and uh, there will be something palpable. Well, it's up to us uh, to change the setting, not to be decided by the man anymore. If you look into this panel, I think there is, uh, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And um, I may be repeating myself, but you have mentioned single mothers, and there is a solution to that, that we would give them opportunity to get better that based on certain argumentation, we will come up with legislative uh, uh, possibilities or we'll identify chances for them and we will just place the information where it should be. This is a way. Mr. Schuster, you are oppressed in this panel, aren't you? Well. There are more female voters than men. We are democracy. This is your your uh, responsibility that you are voting for uh, old uh, boring farts into the parliament. Uh, it's completely absurd that women would cast their vote for a man with 11 children with ten women. This is absolutely impossible. You are a majority. Set the tune. Set the tune for yourself. Okay, so we are getting to this narrative that this is our fault. Well, but no, what I want to say is that you can change it. There, you know, there is more of you, but you just need to start doing it. Before I wrap it up, and okay, we have talked about this. Uh, you see any improvement in financial literacy? I think we have answered that. And do you see difference in be, uh, between men and women? At the beginning, I said that the data uh, that is available is very limited. And Martin has showed that there are not big differences in the financial literacy of men and women, but the behavior is really different. So the quest for risking is very different. We just need to talk about it uh, because we could uh, capitalize on this. Uh, uh, based on the data available, and we did a survey on crypto actives, um, ac uh, activities, 13% of women kind of dived into the waters or uh, put their hands on cryptocurrencies and crypto activities. Uh, but on the other hand, once women invest, uh, their revenues are 2% higher than the revenues of men. A good example would be uh, would be slot machines. Uh, I have never been to a place like that, uh, but um, whatever, uh, but if you go there, you see more men. Uh, there is a bigger quest for risking. 
a monk man and the data clearly shows that the women tend to make their decision based on evidence uh, so let's talk about the benefits and advantages we have that we need to think and then decide this is great and the very discussion that this is possible uh, that it is out there it's 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 great and uh, the only th um, thing statement we have uh, supported by empirical data is that we don't have sufficient self-confidence uh, uh, and when we check the age profile uh, when it comes to financial literacy we see that the relatively good level of financial literacy is among people up to 25 years so, so the education has improved um, and also in the group uh, within 10 years after graduation and the the poorest uh, financial literacy is in the age uh, group of 40 50 and then with age it improves the life has made them learn how to take care of their own money so last two minutes for a wrap up and most probably you you know I would offer my wrap up we should be more vocal in those topics we were talking about the infrastructures nurseries that are very needed so we don't need legislative changes but the overall infrastructure and also as you have said that once you made them answer the women the women gave you correct answers so we should be so we should really see our value and appreciate our value also in the labor market. Thank you very much for this di discussion and for this panel. I very much hope, hope that our guests will talk to you and with you. Thank you very much. I will start with Lubomira Lukačova, <laughs> Jana Brodani. Yulia Chilikova, Elena Kohutikova, and Martin Schuster. Thank you very much. Now it's uh, time for a coffee break, and we should reconvene in 20 minutes. Thank you. So following a short break, we back here with you and we are going to talk about an unusual topic a little, but still interesting. Uh, of course, within the context of uh, women in the labor market, the, guests, the guest uh, of uh, this section is uh, Miroslav Šarivski, Director of Human Resources and Management Organization of Slovenske Elektrárne. Good morning. You also heard the topic uh, we, 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 we've been discussing in the first panel. And since you are from a power uh, sector or energy sector, uh, we'd like to ask you, are women interested in, uh, in this industry and do they uh, apply for jobs here? Uh, no, is the short answer. No, they're not. But Slovakia certainly is not an exception. The data from International Energy Agency and OECD show that power sector or energy sector in general is not a, a very feminine sector it's probably 80 20 percent but energy sector is a very wide very wide industry of course uh, the, the share of uh, men versus women is 18 sorry 15 85 right 50 percent women 85 percent male but it depends where you know we are uh, we generate power we have um, power power stations across whole Slovakia hydro stations uh, nuclear stations the the uh, at the the central the headquarters there's more women for example for example uh, when I look at the third and fourth uh, block of nuclear power there's a relatively large uh, share of women that, I mean compared relatively compared to the rest of the company uh, and now it is not perhaps the important thing that was the current percentage but whether 
uh, we as a company, energy company, we try to do something about it. And if we do, why we are doing something about it? And I'll answer my own question. Uh, we're trying to do something about it. The answer is clearly a very vocal yes. We are trying to do something about it. In 2019, we had only 15% of women. This, uh, sorry, we had 25%. Uh, sorry, 25 women. Now we're employing uh, 62. But we uh, also increased the number of hires in general. But the the ratio of hires, new hires, has increased quite uh, substantially for the benefit of women. Okay, the question is why you are pushing to. Uh, to hire more women in your company? Well, I answer just like I tell to my colleagues internally and I emphasize the business aspect. <coughs> it's no... Uh, uh, it's... Well, perhaps there are also moral reasons, but now I'd like to stress the business reasons from a survey, from a huge Gallup survey conducted in 195 countries of the world. There's a very interesting and, and significant conclusion women are better managers than men yes gallup survey globe gallup survey <coughs> proved that so that's why i came here to say this aloud yes but now to be totally honest with you the, this data i i didn't find this data because of this conference i i found this data i mean i i, I learned about the data i was just looking at the gallup survey results right but mm, but we have uh, uh, we have a program of training of leaders where I am, uh, which I'm part of, and this Gallup survey discussed the issue of uh, male female managers. So it's, this is a part of our mm, effort to to increase the number of male managers. The question is why to look uh, also in women as, as as potential candidates. We go in great depth, and one of the <coughs> reasons uh, what was one of the data I'm lean upon is this Gallup survey. So, from the purely business perspective, it's very important to have more women, hirees, and yes, women are better managers. What it leads us to? It leads us to greater engagement, employee engagement, and higher employee engagement is, of course, very key for any employer, not, on, not only to have uh, engaged employees per se, because p per companies with better engaged employees have better excellency, better performance, higher profits you know, for shareholders, for the company. It's very simple. And for us, also very important, higher security, safety. So that's why, from a business perspective, it is necessary to have greater engagement, and greater engagement will be brought about by higher representation of women. Okay, great that you operate as a, uh, like uh, like this as a company, but when we look at the sort of male industries or industries which are perceived as male, um, we usually we don't see this happening. Uh, companies don't really treat their segments this way, do they? Well, I can only talk on our behalf as a company, and I perceive it this way, and I'm trying to convince my male colleagues to perceive it the same. We need to be talking about this, that's why I'm here, and I accepted your invitation, and I want to talk about these facts, and I could go into, I could dig deeper. Why women are perceived as better managers? meaning that employees who have uh, female bosses are more engaged and it uh, it is related to what the, the the today's era requires from the employees you know the the labor market is changing radically employers need to fight for talent very intensively there's a very intensive war for talent they need to build their employers brand and you know, do a lot of things to become an attractive company for any applicants and uh, there are these managerial skills going getting into the forefront you know in the conservative companies in the past the hard skill was the only thing that was evaluated when you know advancing uh, employee um, on a career ladder especially in technical uh, energy and other industries you know but it's turning out that these managerial skills we, we may call them soft skills are increasingly more important even in these industries are more required increasingly required again a survey which is based in Gallup looking at the change of diction of requirements for managerial positions in other words what is required from new hirees in ma as managers so 15 years ago it was mainly hard skills but now it's 
more and more soft skills that lead to greater engagement of employees, better cooperation, better development of employees. Mm, so, and these are the skills that women somehow dominate over men. Yeah, before we actually sit, sat here on the stage, we were discussing about the topics of this interview and we, we, we wanted to mention also these qualities, but we also wanted to talk about what uh, women can learn from men and I'm not sure even if I want to ask this question. So what we could learn from men, as we as women, but what we could learn uh, within the framework of high management positions? Oh, that's a difficult question. I have no answer. Honestly, I have no answer what you could learn from, from us men. You know, I, I, I don't think there's anything specific women should learn from men. I don't see major difference. I see two curves that cover by 80% in terms of skills and competence. I'm, I'm just, you know, giving ballpark figures, right? But there might be some small differences in specific areas. What women excel in, what, what, what we as men can learn from you as women is, uh, for example, provision of feedback. Giving feedback is a very important factor, which increases uh, employee engagement in the workplace. And, you know, taking care of, you know, progress um, or advance you know, respondents said that female managers take more care uh, about the, the, their employees' career development more than men, uh, you know, achieving objectives. Again, female managers generally, I, I'm not saying this is universal, but in general, female managers tend to sit much more more often with their employees where do you need to develop your career what do you need what sort of training and skill etc etc and these sort of general management skills so we are trying to teach our male managers this this is something which what, what women perhaps naturally tend to have more than men and we want to um, stress you know appra uh, employee appraisals you know feedback <coughs> constructive feedback to employees etc etc but we're not talking only about managerial skills sorry managerial positions that you want to feminize feminize so to say so if <coughs> someone is interested in energy sector uh, and your um, approach as, as company besides managerial position positions what other positions are can be given to women. Well, I have a long list here for this, but I'll just mention a few. Well, first of all, the <coughs> the, the uneven ratio between men and women is, is a result of the fact that we have a lot of, you know, blue-collar positions. And blue-collar positions, of course, uh, there is a huge, uh, there's a huge difference between men and women, you know, welders, uh, electricians, you know, and mechanical uh, mechanical operators. We have very, very few women. There's no zero, but in the past three years, I think we hired. Let me let me see. Uh, dispatcher in railway and water management, mechanical uh, engineering operators. We had maybe one percent of women compared to ninety-nine percent of men, and of course the ratio is changing uh, in when it comes to you know qualifications or other skills so when we talk about non-managerial positions we hire technicians specialists project managers we have project engineer specialists for the uh, nuclear power plant <coughs> uh, uh, project designer project designer coordinator of process of engineering in the nuclear power construction uh, at sake security engineer you know so these are all uh, positions technical positions where we have women then we have the standard um, positions like um, you know HR finance or accounting where women are much more uh, much more <coughs> much more frequently represented we were talking about gender pay gap how do you see that well we as employer we have no other way no, no other thing to say than we are trying to eliminate any pay gap because we have to do so based on the uh, section 119 of, of, of the legislation that's all I can say and since we have a planning administrative manager uh, and and who is female and she's responsible for for elimination of this pay gap so I believe I can say that it shouldn't happen that we have sort of we are out of certain range because we have some ranges of course for a specific position a specific ranking which is based on performance and many other factors that 
that we take into account, but in principle we want to uh, be compliant with the legislation. Uh, I can even sort of blow our own trumpets because we won the the title of the best employer of the year in Profesia.sk because also because we're trying to comply with this aspect. You were talking about very interesting positions, but important fact question is whether women actually want to study technical subjects and they seem to be not very interested in that. So there's quite a few quite few women in the market on these positions. Yes, certainly you're right. But we also do something, do our bit. I I, I know that we're not going to change the world or, or Slovakia, but we have some activities uh, supporting women studying science and technology in 2016 we had a we had a project titled mission to mars for secondary schools under the auspices with uh, Michaela Musilova perhaps you know Mishka Musilova she's an astrobiologist working for NASA Slovak astrobiologist and within that project mission to mars we're trying to approach teams we simulate Ma mission to mars and Michaela is still there she's the face of the project we have lots of uh, girl collectives. Some of the winners were, you know, female collectives, girls, because this is secondary schools project. So this is one of the ways how to persuade, convince more women to, you know, study um, science and technology. You know, examples of a successful woman that uh, have a that has a successful career in a discipline which is typically male dominated, and she achieved a really great achievement. So this is one of the ways how to uh, how to succeed. Perhaps after our discussion I will perceive your company very differently as a more feminine company so you're succeeding perhaps. Uh, I'll think about my career ch uh, a career change sooner or later. Yeah we can have a yeah well, I'll leave you my business card and we can have a phone call. No seriously I really like this approach and um, I, uh, I'm convinced that a number of companies in your sector should perhaps uh, approach these matters differently. Uh, we are running out of time, so just to conclude this, maybe uh, as we summarize in the first panel, what do you see as a trend for the future in terms of employment and approach to to women and um, women in the labor market? Any trends? Well, any employer that will not focus specifically on this target group is basically uh, taking away talented uh, individuals from themselves. You know. If one part of the labor market is out, out of your radar, your pool to choose from is much smaller. So it would be an idiotic move. I mean, no other way to say that. It's an idiot move uh, than not to ignore, you know, female uh, section of the population. So we need to we need to uh, be proactive. We need to be proactive, and we're certainly very far from where we want to be, but at least we are getting there. Thank you, Miroslav Sharishsky, Director of Human Resources and Management Organization of Slovenska Elektrarnie. Thank you very much. You can still sit around and we will ask next panelist Lubica Binka Hamarova, consultant for growth and macroeconomy for the World Bank who will talk about mm, empowering women and empowering and strengthening the position of women. There are many things uh, in which men and women are different. I don't want to start with our differences, but with uh, what what is uh, really a common phenomenon for us. We all pay taxes and therefore we should all be interested what is done with the taxes, so what kind of world the politicians create and whether this world is really for everybody. Today Slovakia has about 50-50 distribution of men and women, but uh, this uh, figure is not represented um, in the Slovak parliament, only 21% of women. You would say this is not that bad, but it hasn't changed much from the 90s. Oh, should we bother at all? Because we live in democracy, both men and women have voting rights, and uh, we as women also cast our votes for men. 
and uh, men politicians also uh, compete for our female voices uh, and ballots therefore not only through their um, promises uh, but also through their actions they should reflect our needs but the truth is that uh, there's a growing number of studies that the gender representation has an impact on policies and on the type of policies um, that are produced at the national level. And since I just will um, prove yet again what was uh, heard in the first panel, uh, I want to support it with more data. Uh, kindergartens and nurseries, this is not the problem of Slovakia only, but also Bavaria. But they have found out that in those municipal uh, parliaments where with more women, the number of nurseries uh, or the places in nurseries and kindergartens grew by more than 40%. And it was not only because women were in the uh, in the municipal parliaments, but uh, the because they were pushing the agenda. Uh, caring for children is considered traditionally as female agenda. So all of a sudden it was put on the table of municipalities and then it was reflected in policy outcomes such as increasing the number of places in kindergartens. Then quotas in Europe and their implications on policy outcomes. This study talks about the fact that in those states where the quotas were introduced, the overall dialogue in the labor market policies has changed. Well, how? H how maternal leave and parental leave is perceived? In those countries with quotas, we can see the shift from maternal to parental leave to father's leave. This had a secondary impact. on better integration of women into the labor market also once they started their families. Next, this is an interesting study where Lippmann looked into the situation in France, uh, what kind of laws are uh, put on table. There is a certain literature alluding to male and female domains and Lippmann gives us an overview saying that women had women were proposing bills on health and social care more than 50 percent more often than women men uh, tend to were uh, proposing bills um, regarding uh, defense economy etc this is a swedish uh, research proving that introducing simple quota that men and women have a s similar positions on uh, the on the list of candidates uh, sort of uh, generated high level of compet uh, competition and in the end of the day uh, increase the quality of uh, the political parties and candidates. I don't have good EU example, but it seems that something starts happening when uh, women enter politics. Uh, something sort of cracks. The well-established routines are cracked. Um, the corruption uh, it decreases, the institutions are better performing, and this all has long-term effect because more women in policy and normalize the higher presence of women and uh, female in politics in the future. That sounds good, at least for me. So why this is not the case? I am an economist. I like to offer an economic perspective through demand and supply. Let's talk about demand. What do I mean by demand? Do we as a society demand uh, female leaders? Do we want females to lead us? And then uh, let's uh, look into the first argument. The French study shows 
I think this is not the case. Both uh, women and men prefer male leaders. This study was specifically looking into the perception of men and women in the regions and what kind of an implications it has on their voting preferences. And in spite of the fact, our uh, although there are quotas in France, uh, they are non-efficient because, especially in the regions wi with uh, probably not politically correct perspective on women, uh, the males were winning in the elections. And the second problem might be political parties. Parties are very important play player or stakeholder because they are the door uh, keeper. They either open the door or slam the door on you. In Spain, they looked into the following. If they are traditionally male leaders of uh, political parties, they tend to prefer male can uh, male uh, members uh, and male leaders. But let's look at the offer side. Now, when talking about offer, um, we um, the question is what uh, or no the question the statement is that we have uh, enough number of women uh, who are interested in public affairs. Uh, currently, 67 percent of females work in public uh, sector. That's a lot. And of course it shows that women want to work for society, want to mm, chip in. They are interested in public affairs, so they care. And this is uh, high, this number is high because of uh, social affairs, uh, healthcare and education. But let's look one level up. Almost half, 50% uh, oh, of women are in decision-making uh, positions, general directors, etc. This looks really good. So I would say that, uh, conclude that uh, there is competence. But if we go one layer up, something happens. Women as candidates in parliamentary elections. This is very indicative about the number, the representation of women uh, in the parliament. In 2020 parliamentary elections, there were only 20% of uh, the women running for the elections and that we have about 20% of women sitting in the parliament. What happens between, where is this gap coming from? That people are in, uh, that women are interested in politics, but sort of don't dare. We need more than ten minutes to answer this, but let's not only focus on the problem, but also on the solutions. I, it, it is said that if the economists don't like where the uh, the demand and offer match, uh, they start regulating. One of the possibilities, and I need to say that we haven't um, made much progress uh, as a society, one of the possibilities are quotas. Uh, quotas are very unpopular in Slovakia, and it really, uh, I mean, makes some people steaming. And then people are saying, okay, are the women going to be competent? Isn't this against the principle of, uh, of merit? But the whole idea, the baseline idea that the quotas are here to eliminate barriers is just fading in the discussion. Yet again, we uh, think, or I think, that the debate in Slovakia is basically such that the quotas, this is a, a, like um, some kind of... Um, invention of Scandinavian countries, and this is kind of a, a, a luxurious invention of Scandinavian countries, uh, but this is not the case. When we say quotas, we, we some understand it 50-50, this is not the case. Quotas, uh, uh, that there's a whole spectrum of solutions uh, depending on the readiness of the society. It could be like in Sweden in, uh, in the 90s when the only proposal was that the men and women are uh, kind of uh, 
uh, included on the lists of candidates of political parties, uh, there should be one man and one uh, followed by one woman, and uh, they would kind of like take turns on the list. And this is the uh, like softest way up to the fact that, for instance, political parties would need to have 50% of female candidates and 50 uh, of male. This could maybe solve the issue of demand and offer, and then very hard measures that the mm, places would be basically distributed among b between men and women. So it's not only about 50-50 solutions. 30-40% is the critical mass that can bring about a change. So the quotas are set to this uh, threshold, 30 or 40%. But quotas are only a tool. Tool that need that. But before that, there should be a huge pu uh, public discourse uh, that would lead to the conclusion that we really care about women being in politics and up to the fa to the level that we need want to regulate it um, but the change needs to come from the society therefore what we can do today is to support each other if there is a clever female uh, colleague uh, or a boss or my partner at home, then uh, let's uh, support them, not only by patting them on their shoulder, but by expressing respect and by saying that they can really count with the, uh, on us so when even if things don't work. And this is where I would like to end my presentation. and underline and reiterate that it's up to us how, how this is going to look like in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This was Lubica Binka Hamarova from World Bank. Thanks so much for your presentation. <coughs> and I leave <coughs> you free, Mr. Sharisky. Also, it came to my mind that you were sitting here all the time. At least you checked the presentation just like I did from the monitor below here of course and now i'd like to ask the next speakers uh, to join our panel we are going to have Teresa Yatsova, co-founder and former manager for uh, investment in neology ventures uh, also Zuzana Kedranova, founder of sustainable fashion brand Yura Studio, and Marov Cherik, CEO and chairman of borders at Partners Investment so uh, we'll have uh, I see already Mr. Ofcherik. Come, don't worry, don't be afraid. Again, please try to sit under your photos if you recognize yourselves. And since you are on the stage once again. That is Ayatsova, co-founder and former uh, manager for investment at New Lodge Ventures. Zuzana Kedranova, founder of Yura Studio, a sustainable fashion brand. And Maros Ocherik, CEO and chairman of the board at Partners Investment. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to talk about investment, and female entrepreneurs and female investors. Uh, in the first panel, we've already heard that we have uh, what sort of investment appetite we have as Slovak women uh, and whether we actually wish or desire you know, to be entrepreneurs. So we'll start with uh, ladies and then we will listen to Mr. Ovčarik. Uh, so, Ms. Jacova, do you recommend that women should invest? Well, I certainly do recommend women and men to invest more than keeping the money on saving accounts etc perhaps this topic is getting increasingly popular because of the inflation because of the economic situation we're facing which is good because people get more interested in all these issues and matters and, and it's great that people get interested and, and f if women get more interested you know investment is extremely important for women because we've heard that, that women live longer than men they earn less than men and therefore their situation uh, on the, during retirement is uh, well worse to put to, to put simply to, uh, so, so it's a question you should ask yourself 
how do you want your life to look like when you retire? Imagine yourselves, imagine what you want to do when you retire. And it's good to start now. It's never too late to start. The worst thing is to stop. So perhaps sometimes is enough if you, if you reduce your investment sum when you're on a maternity leave or you are facing a difficult situation in your family, you need to maintain the periodic periodicity, the, the frequency of investment of investments. But I don't want to make this sound like this is more important for women than it is for men. No, but women often don't do that or do it less because they have smaller income or they don't know enough about it or they need to m do more research more sort of education that's why we try to attract women to this world of investment more but it should be all equally it's not like men should be investing uh, sorry uh, women should be investing and, and men shouldn't no and when i was working in the bank we had a survey that women le uh, earn less but they save more they had higher amounts on their savings account but they're more in conservative when it comes to investing these these funds so Another question that I have is, do you invest on a regular basis? I mean, this is a question for the audience. Uh, do you invest on a regular basis? Now it's 50-50, yes, no. Uh, I'd like to ask you in our audience to, to, um, to answer the question. It's, it's a poll. So the question, of course, regards regular investment. Slido here is not only for this poll question, but also to ask a question to our guests, we will we will use them at the end of the discussion. But let's now return to financial management, personal financial management. Mm, do you believe that financial literacy has been improving in recent years? I'm usually a, a, a big optimist. I, I, I'm an optimist, but unfortunately, in this topic, the data shows that the situation is getting worse. Certainly, it's not improving, and also. The, the period of corona pandemic shows this. But th this perhaps goes across both sexes, you know, population as a whole. Financial literacy in Slovakia is rather poor. It starts in at a young age, at elementary schools, where the education is not sufficient. I believe that it starts in the family and education or lack of it in the family, because all the people are not very open in this topic. They can't communicate about this with their children and therefore it's just not good uh, and this is proven also by the situation during the corona pandemic that people just didn't save up enough for this you know three to six months which is like the recommended you know cushion to or the the the, the buffer you know well many families uh, found themselves in a very bad situation because they didn't save up this this buffer for three to six months which is uh, the basics of uh, you know personal financial management so this is this is something that has turned out again this doesn't mean that it cannot change but it's important to look to, to look at it important to realize this and you know I, I have a economic educa economic education so uh, perhaps it is uh, more simple for me to get to the information and to understand the information a little better but perhaps what I do as a person in terms of financial literacy and education is that I open this topic on a regular basis with my friends and people I know when we sit out to have a drink or when we sit at the playground with our children because this is one of the ways to go spread awareness you know statistics say that people talk more often about sex than they do about money and this this says something about this are you popular among your friends when you start this discussion well okay this obviously doesn't have to be a discussion about how much you earn and how much you put there and how much you invest there and how much money you have of course it depends on how close you are with your friends but generally when the when a, a topic is a taboo, people will never learn more, people never get inspired, people will never be able to learn how to do things differently. You know, just a couple of days ago at the playground with our kids, we were talking about saving and investments for children, how to start with it. And another friend was talking about how to actually talk about this with children, you know, you know saving in a piggy bank and uh, how much money you can put, uh, how much money you can spend on buying this and like toys etc etc so these are just the beginnings of the topic and for me it was easier because i come from a family of entrepreneurs so we're, we're doing business had influence on me as a person growing up the topic of money was very open who pays in, uh, invoices who pays the bills are there any you know late 
payments of uh, of ours to our suppliers or our clients or whether we will have to we have bad cash flow in the family so it was a very open topic for, for, for me in our family so much easier for me to communicate this also now when i'm an adult and i try to get it across the whole society because this seems to be a taboo and then i hear basic question from a friend of mine during you know walking with the kids like about monthly investments or savings uh, the, 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 uh, or division of finance in the family or in marriage about how she has to ask her husband to give her money because her maternity leave doesn't support her enough so these are crazy things and it seems to me that these friends are too wise and too smart to to deal with this basic question but this reflection of the society and the and the knowledge that is across the society so let's look at the answers from the audience to invest on a regular basis so 73 percent say yes to regular investment so it seems that the, our audience is better than the average. Now, let's look at the statistics. Mr. Ofcerik, what about the overall investments of Slovaks? We are very conservative when it comes to personal finance, right? We don't want to talk about it. It's a, it's a topic that is a, a burden, or it's considered to be a burden, but investment is very important, very important topic because with 14% inflation, and it seems to be that the next year it might be even 20% inflation, nothing else, there's no other way to go around than to do something with your money. If we look at the statistics of OECD countries, Slovakia has been in the long term bringing up the rear of the chart. Only Greece is behind us. Financial assets of Slovaks are is divided into conservative products like uh, um, saving accounts or very very conservative products that have zero potential to protect money from uh, from inflation so in this respect slovak households or slovakia is a country where as much as 70 percent is held on these conservative financial products like uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, saving accounts or, or, or current accounts and that's a problem we do um, a, a survey uh, annually through focus agency and we find and we, we found that how many people actually invest are outside the, th the second or third pension pillar and last year the result was only 14 percent 14 percent of Slovaks really invest into funds shares etc this year it's 18 percent it's improving but it's very very small uh, percentage and it's a huge shame it's a, and if we continue to be bringing up the rear of this chart of countries as a, as, as a country we will be getting poorer because with 14 percent inflation it's not possible to to catch up on the wealthier countries because inflation in most cases in most years it's higher than um, uh, interest rates on conservative financial products so unless we move at least one part of our savings and i'm not promoting my own services but unless we move a greater part of our money into investments just like most uh, people in advanced countries do it we will be suffering we will suffer we will be poorer and we will be getting less and less wealthier one more figure talking about statistics we asked households how many people have any idea what's the inflation like in Slovakia 40% of people have no idea what's the inflation they either answered it's up to 10% because it's been over 13 at the moment it's 14.2% and the remaining I think 27% said that it's under 10% now and the th and 13 percent of the population said they have no idea what's the inflation so four out of ten people don't know what's the inflation like they don't know what it is doing to their money in their bank accounts in the in the or at homes under the financial counseling you meet with the uh, stand ordinary people how and to talk to them how to invest uh, what's the difference between men and women when it comes to saving and investments firstly when we talk about 18 percent of people where uh, who invest you know this is uh, kind of uh, difficult to talk about it as a representative sample but it depends on who has the money in the family it's mostly one not both of the adult members uh, of the household 
who keep the budget. Um, 60 to 40 is the current um, combination, that means 60% of men and 40% of women. But if we talk about impact investment, where the investment is not only about protecting the money, but should also positively influence the society, that's where women are more, much more stronger and they are the main target segment of those kind of investments and those are positive signals where investment can actually um, get to women better but this will have to do also with the fact that um, even if we look into the investments by men and women men tend to invest in a dynamic way, for short term, uh, in speculative way, and women tend to opt for conservative balanced products for a longer period of time and regular basis in smaller amounts. There is another question, if you invest or if you decide to invest, the decisive factor in investment would be profit or positive sus uh, sustainable outcome well profit is number one but when it comes to women sustainability and positive uh, mm, public uh, impact uh, is uh, what is really considered uh, by women much more uh, Mr. Ofterik uh, you mentioned ESG investments um, as a kind of a hype and trendy thing, especially in young generations. Uh, but, but are we talking about young women? ESG investment is investment into sustainable, responsible investments. Those investments have potential to improve the ecology, that's the E, then improve the social dimension also including gender equality, human rights, protec data protection, and G stands for government. That means um, governance, uh, uh, independence of management, um, and prevention of corruption, etc. So if we look into ESG, this is a very strong investment trend in the world, uh, especially in the EU. It's uh, slowly getting and penetrating into the U.S. and emerging markets. And uh, long-term surveys show that uh, women are the most interested in ESG and millennials up to 40. In case of millennials, it's 70 to 80 percent of people who either have or plan mm, to include ESG investments into their overall plan. And we are not talking about assets. In Europe, um, ESG investments represent 44 percent of investments in all investment strategies of the EU investors. And what's really interesting is to see the long-term trend. The figure is not that important, but um, what is important that the figure is growing in all important regions. We are talking about sustainability in the fashion industry. And Ms. Kedronova, since you founded a sustainable fashion brand, why? What's your story? Uh, Yura Studio um, produces wedding dresses from certified um, materials and uh, our sustainability is not only in materials but also lies in the fact that uh, we can redesign a wedding uh, dress uh, for ordinary ordinary occasions and the you know because the wedding dress is usually worn only once, but um, we are striving to bring the dress back to the life cycle. We work with pure uh, bio mm, cotton and uh, also silk and other materials. We know the source of the materials, we really care and double check the source and for more than two years we needed to map 
the sources uh, of the material. So there were problems when you tried to retrieve the materials. I've been working under this brand for seven years and we really had been looking for those materials for one or two years and you know back then slow fashion didn't ring the bell and there were n no materials like that so it was quite difficult uh, to get those materials Sustainability in this context uh, is uh, means also higher price. Are people willing to pay for sustainable dress? When it comes to prices, I'm still fighting the fight, but uh, the, the older we get, the more identified I get uh, with my work and the better I can work with the uh, with the prices, but um, to your question whether the customer can appreciate the quality and uh, and everything and the story of this brand, um, it's better from year to year and I totally believe in the positive trend. And if you look into the competitive environment, then how do the businesses approach this topic? Do you do you have competition or do other companies think about sustainability as well? When it comes to sustainability in the wedding world, I'm not uh, aware of the fact that there would be a similar brand in Slovakia that would focus this uh, on this sustainable approach. But when it comes to sustainable fashion brands, I think there, there are more and more brands like this and I'm very happy for that. But when talking about sustainability, um, if you invest uh, and you look into profit and or sustainability, it's still the profit is still number one. Mr. Ofcierig, you probably don't um, take this as a surprise because if you, uh, you invest, you want to have a profit. And if we talk about ESG uh, investments, are we talking about lower profits? No. But of course, there's a context to it. ESG investments are long-term investments. And the real ESG investments are based on the fact that those companies that are uh, ecologically um, responsible and well-managed should be sustainable and in short, uh, sorry, in mid and uh, long-term horizon should have better economic results because there would be eventually less regulation, lower taxes, etc. So this may not be the case. Mm, that uh, ESG doesn't bring uh, sufficient profit and according to many statistics uh, m many ESG uh, investments uh, are uh, more profitable than other types of investments but you know it always depends on their preference because if there were some haters of ESG investments they would prove you that, that this is not the case and that uh, the the profit is not sufficient what really really matters is that those investments are long term and they should be more welcomed by business. You shouldn't think about ESG investments as investments into windmills or water dams. This is not a narrow sector of investments. E ESG investments uh, are the following. There is a specific industry risk that is assessed for each and every industry, uh, there are different criteria. And for instance, companies in the oil industry are assessed in comparison with other oil making companies. And it is evaluated which of the companies are better managed, are more ecological, and only those uh, that are the best in the industry are selected. And you know, the, this is uh, this assessment is carried out sector by sector, travel industry, others. So investments into ESG is very similar to investments into any other area. It's about value. Those. Uh, with higher ESG score have a higher weight and are preferred in the investments. But uh, I really don't think uh, that this would lead into lower profits, especially in the long run. And if the people invest into ESG, 
there is something like um, a willingness to stick or stay with the investments although or even in the situations when markets are volatile because uh, the, the usual tendency is that when the markets get volatile and wobbly uh, then uh, the retail investors uh, are fleeing the market and uh, but if there is an impact investment uh, impact investing so it's not about only protecting your money but about having a good feeling that you contribute to making the world a better place then you have higher level of tolerance uh, towards the volatility in the market and that is protective uh, I was thinking about how to make leeway now, so actually I will change the topic ladies a question for you since I was asking in the first panel and I will detour from the investments I'm interested in your opinions on the in investment and um, your perspective on how is it doing business in Slovakia for women how is it with investment is it more complicated than when you if you were a man from my investors perspective the data shows that uh, most of women start with business during maternity leave and I think this is a trend in the most of the EU countries but we, if we talk about our region it probably has its reasons this is uh, often the time when women start doing business and I support uh, I'm a proof of this statistic I also started my business during my maternity leave whether it is more difficult than in case of men I don't know it's difficult for me to answer in objective way maybe from the practical perspective when we talk about investments often what I say to the women is uh, how to invest and how that they should invest into their own business and that's actually a long-term investment which is okay and often I see that women are prone to using their own money only they don't take micro loans or loans this is due to the fact that they are more conservative I presume and we as investors uh, are trying to encourage them and show them the way that if they take the external support either from our fund or from other entities that support female business um, persons then you can um, grow more rapidly you can take a better market share you can be more competitive maybe you can come to the market with something that is more innovative maybe more expensive but more innovative uh, so often what I do when talking to female uh, entrepreneurs I try to explain that it's great to ha take external money if you have a good business plan if you show that uh, if you can prove that uh, you will be able to pay back the money and that um, you will be uh, it will be a successful job it, in the end of the day it may bring more results I am meeting more female entrepreneurs than male entrepreneurs but w what I need to say is that men are less conservative they tend to think about external investment at the first place because probably the level of confidence is much higher that it, it will simply work they will be able to pay it back and uh, maybe this is the difference uh, what I see and what I try to advise to the female entrepreneurs of course this doesn't work for everybody it depends on the business plan but you shouldn't be afraid you shouldn't count only on your own money and whether you have saved enough to to reach out for your goal because uh, usually women tend to dream about things and maternity leave is the breaking point 
Well, since you said this, I've been thinking about this, how these discussions are taking place at these kindergartens or playgrounds or these pubs and bars and cafes. When you talk about the finance, what sort of questions you keep hearing? Sometimes you, you pointed out that these are very essential, basic questions, like these women don't know what to do with their money, how to manage their personal finance when it comes to insurance, you know, um, investment, which is like um, something extra. So how these discussions take place? Well, do you advise them to just go for it and they will go for it? Well, yes, also, this is perhaps the objective, how to, you know, inspire from one another, you know, to advise, to provide advice to one another, wh what to do with uh, your money. And, you know, for me, money is just a, a, a means to an end. You know, how to get something that you really want in your life. And money is just a vehicle for that. So I ask my friends, what they actually want, how they want to live. I mean, is it about um, a short-term horizon, like they want to travel somewhere, or is it about, mm, for example, getting their child to the best university and they want to be able to pay for that so that money is not a barrier in the education of the children. So it's about the dreams or objectives of um, the people I know. And that's why I like to help entrepreneurs, because I really like to, to hear about all the business plans in the world, because I just like it. I like to listen to that. And I like to see that happening. And the objective of the discussion is, yes, how to do things better than the others. And, you know, I, I, I tell my friends who think about doing business, well, I tell them, tell it as many people as you possibly can, because then you can either get some user experience perspective or investor's perspective, or you may meet the right people. You never know who gonna introduce you to whomever else. You know, people have you know friends or neighbors or or classmates from secondary school. You know, it snowballs. It snowballs, and some of them will tell me, "But what if someone steals my idea?" Well. No, it's not happening like that. It doesn't happen w but with you saying something to someone else. If the business is going to be successful, it's going to be successful because of you, because of your, your experience, your know-how, your, your commitment. You know, If it was about s some business that is extremely easy to copy, then it would be done by the Indians somewhere, You know, if we talk about that. But if we talk about something that you want, something that you know, something that you dream about, you, it doesn't happen that you're going to tell this to someone over a beer and next day they steal your idea. No, it's, it certainly shouldn't be a barrier for you. You know what I mean? As many people as you can talk to. The, the, the more people you talk to, the better. Miss Kedronova, when you think about your beginnings, was it actually a topic? Or is it a topic for you to, to, to say whether it's more difficult for women? than men to start business. I, I don't really think there's many major difference between men and women. I mean, who, who's got it more difficult when they are, you know, starting their entrepreneurial career? I mean, just yesterday I was talking to a friend. When the, I, I started doing business with a very naive idea, you know, no plans. It was very headless, but all the more it was, it was honest. And, th and I wouldn't have done it differently looking back over my shoulder I'm an emotional type of person. I, I, I gave my whole heart to it. And I think this is the reason why I, I relatively quickly spread the, the idea or my, my, the name of my company among people. Or I got where I am now today. So I wouldn't change things differently. Maybe I would trust myself better. I would have more confidence in myself. And comparing the male and versus female perspective, perhaps males tend to be more confident maybe they have you know bigger shoulder but big bigger, bigger elbows but maybe uh, it's just an impression uh, maybe i'm wrong uh, it was all very spontaneous and the, and the, these whole seven years i've been you know doing business with my you know creative work it's been a very beautiful way a very beautiful journey the beginnings were very spontaneous and it was like well we'll see what the next day begins uh, sorry what the next day brings sorry and you know it cr w creative work gives me pleasure and happiness and it's like this the same day i don't want this to be forced forceful or negative and it's it's been like that ever since so you also promote the sustainability or this is something you bet on uh, do, do you perceive it this is just a most recent fashionable trend or do you see potential in sustainability also for the future 
I believe sustainability is a, is a necessity for the future. Talking about fashion, I first heard about sustainability eight or nine years ago when Rana Plaza fell. It was, it, was a, it was a huge factory in India which was producing fast fashion. And then I first heard about the, the topic of slow fashion and fa versus the fast fashion. And for me, it was a shock. I was still a university student. I was an undergraduate and I had a crisis of whether it actually makes sense to, to make fashion, and, you know, just produce next <coughs> rags you know, and, and I was thinking like where I, I, I'll go. I, I still wanted to do fashion. I really loved fashion, but I didn't like the, the fast fashion as, 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 a, as a concept, you know. So I thought, OK, if I'm going to stay in fashion, I'm going to be creative. I can only do, you know, things that are sustainable. What would be your advice to, you know, startups in fashion? What would you or not only in fashion, but any men or women who want to, you know, make uh, to to establish a s startup. You said courage. Yes, certainly courage, and boldness, and confidence. And uh, for, uh, for sh you know, for, for a short period of time, I was employee in a corporate with a sales position, and it was 12 months of of, uh, of of a discouraging experience. And after those 12 months, I thought to myself, I will either do what fulfills me and what makes me happy, or I'll be looking, for, um, I'll be searching for that, but I will never work in a corporate again. So my advice is, you know, jump, jump into it with your straight feet, you know, because I read about the person who is afraid of, you know, starting his or her business for three years, but they are not afraid of spending their whole life, from Monday to Friday, nine to five, and you know, saving money for for one vacation in a year, and then looking forward for Friday and being and shaking with fear because of Monday. You know, that's not what I want. I want to be working with happiness because my work is not really work; it's 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 a hobby. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. But I saw the statistics about startups or starting entrepreneurs. Uh, I saw that a great many of them, after a few months or within a year, they end up also because they have no, they have no financial support because of these huge plans they have grant plans. But the statistics show that females were actually better because they fight perhaps harder. And they don't give up as early as as men is that so well yes based on my own last 10 years since i've been uh, dealing with investments into startups i would say that even regionally it's, it's different uh, meaning if i looked at the slovak and czech entrepreneurs the length of their perseverance after they ran out of money was much longer compared to european western european or american startups because in america you 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 uh, you run out of money you close the shop end of deal and the next day you start a new business here in Slovakia or Czech Republic we, we, we've seen entrepreneurs who ran out of money they couldn't seem to earn money by selling their product or service so they moved into their parents or they you know scrapped up the bottom of the barrel and, and they, they still said well let's give it a three or four or five months hopefully I will convert this one big uh, one big client of course it's a question to what degree this is healthy and to what degree you should be able to you should be able to differentiate this is a non-functioning business model but the perseverance is quite strong here and I think that perhaps women might be a little more perseverant but maybe in a different perspective women seem to be willing to get advice from external people, you know, from external advisors we had from for these uh, startups. They were willing to convert the product to a totally different market just to give it a one more try. To have this to have this drive, they they kept their momentum and they let others advise them. And and it's two out of three cases it turned out to be a good idea actually. And that's when it shows that the business after all is about the the person the product will never be perfect or service your, your product can be changed modified offer a different segment different clients but the business will always be successful only because of that person who stands behind it who drives the business and that's the that's the number one thing when we evaluate the business to whether in, to invest in it or not 
what's the track record of the person what's the chemistry between us what others uh, told us told us about him or her his partners or her partners so this is the key thing about startups because the product is is, is very early to to say whether it's going to be successful or not we, you you can't tell really so what would you recommend when starting doing business this is an uncertain period this period of uncertainty the corona crisis barely ended and we have energy crisis and this is very much affecting the business environment is this actually the time to begin uh, you know, to start business. It's a question for you, Mr. Ms. Yatsova. Well, of course you should start. Of course you should start. There were good times, there were bad times. And uh, as I said, I'm, I'm a great optimist. I believe in, an opportun in opportunities. I believe that crises actually uh, bring opportunities. And uh, always, in the times of crisis, the, the best businesses were, and best opportunities uh, for investors appeared you know looking at it historically so the the times will never be ideal and the the, con the 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 context will never be good and the circumstances will never be ideal but if you have an idea or if you have a push you want that or if you have people around you thinking about whom you're thinking to start business with it makes sense you don't know what happens tomorrow go ahead Miss mm, Kadranova, were you affected by the energy crisis and the corona crisis well honestly corona affected me positively because after many many years i slowed down which was great and with this slowing down i started to do even better paradoxically i started to to um, value myself and my free time i started to treat myself with peace and, and time and quality time for myself which i didn't do and with this resting mind i started to have new ideas new concepts and i could actually forward or uh, progress the brand even better so looking back at these two years of corona crisis it gave me a great distance and possibilities of growth so yeah it was great these crises uh they always bring opportunity we've heard that and perhaps we all agree mr ofcharik now there's perhaps more pressure uh talk about crises bring bringing opportunities to invest perhaps uh, what to do in these times, times like these, with money, if we, if we're supposed to advise men or women, what to do now? We, you, let's say we have some money, how to save up, the, you know, sorry, how, how to set up the savings policies, uh, how to invest so that you can avoid you know issues when, when when the next crisis comes so that we don't have to face the the face the dilemma of what, what we can afford what we cannot afford the crisis will show how uh, we were preparing for it beforehand especially for those who were not uh, prepared it's a very strong stimuli how to rearrange their um, budget and improve their financial stability. It's about, uh, you know, there's this hidden potential graph uh, and often you don't don't find one single thing that when, when it is changed everything um, will change again. It's often it's about small time changes you need to, uh, need to make over time and responsibly. The problem is that with the safe uh, oh sorry with the first um, changes your expectations are higher than real results and many are turned down. But if you are persevering, then the break-even will come when the results will come in much higher intensity than uh, at the beginning. But sometimes it takes months, uh, weeks, uh, years. It depends on whether we are talking about personal money, funds or personal development. So in principle, this is in an impulse for changes and crisis. Um, in connection with changes, whether to do something or not. Well, there is a very interesting claim that uh, in crisis money moves from impatient to patient. So for those who uh, panic, 
who are impatient, who don't believe in the future, you know, they are uh, t overwhelmed by panic and they withdraw their money, sell their assets, sell their uh, investments and those who know how uh, markets are working, they wait for this uh, situation. There's always buyer and seller in the market. While it is very unlikely that both sides are not sophisticated enough in worse times, one side is more sophisticated than the other, and then the other way around. That's why this is really a stimuli impulse for assessment. And we are talking about family money, then there is a rule of a thumb. 10, 20, 30, 40, many of you have come across this rule, and we were talking, uh, but I don't know, what it, I'm confused, what does it mean, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, uh, but before this panel we were talking and some are completely freaking out, uh, from this, that because those are ideal measures of family budget and uh, not all budgets can fit in and the lower the income, the, w the more difficult it is to fit in to this uh, ideal proportion. Mm, the 10 stands for 10% of the net family income should be earmarked for short-term reserves. So I should, if I don't have them, it's uh, very important to have them. 20 should go to long-term assets, uh, education, housing, uh, pension, and 30, maximum 30 percent should go into mm, mortgages and loans, etc. If I don't have loans or mortgages, I can create something else, and 40% is consumption. And the higher the income, the better uh, managed uh, personal uh, funds, the easier it is to fit in. So, Profit wins over sustainability and positive impact, but I think that you still feel the sustainability more. Just to conclude, because we have five to six minutes of uh, wrap up, if we were to say something uh, like what uh, we should be wary of when it comes to investments, what would be a recommendation to women, Ms. Kedronova? well, what they should watch out for. I'm not really competent to s talk about that because I'm from artsy and fashion business. But if I were to give a piece of advice, well, you just should not give up. Um, if you, when you are starting a business, you need to wait for your result. But if you are really determined and it is uh, dear to you, I think it's a question of time only until the success comes and hits in. So I would romanticize it. And how about any prerequisites for business? Well, you need to find a um, product that is uh, close to your heart and you shouldn't be overthinking it because if any business, uh, if some business uh, is just uh, created due to overthinking and you are trying to come up with the solution that will bring you the highest uh, um, profit, then, uh, you know, problems may occur soon, you may get bored, you won't be patient enough. So if you, uh, you know, if there are problems on your road and you, l but you like your work, you are able to overcome them. And since there are those discussions and women get network and get connected. Maybe it's important to help each other. Uh, uh, I think that uh, there are many initiatives uh, that are happening, but, uh, but uh, you, uh, you are, I hope you are still uh, supporting uh, each other. I work in a fully female um, team. I'm very thankful for that. And our clients represent also uh, brides, uh, females, and I'm glad that we cooperate also after the wedding dress is ready. So yes, we support each other. 
Ms. Yatsova, what would be your recommendation? Not only when it comes to business and startups, but overall when it comes to investments and mm, attitude to money. You shouldn't be panicking when you look into the markets. The situation in the market is devastating as of the beginning of uh, the year. But really what you should think about is a long-term horizon. There's a statistical difference between men and women. Last week I read this uh, report. The the headline was not good because it was like why women are better investors than men. I don't think this is the case, but okay, the the article analyzed the characteristics of uh, men and women that the uh, women do more research before investing. They know that they are prone to trends, uh, men meaning. So it seems that uh, women have advantage. They are looking longer, they are studying longer, but they don't uh, do business as often as men. There was a huge difference, somewhere between 50% higher percentage of men does business than women. Because, you know, if something is falling, they pull it out and then they invest in some some somewhere else. So this is the general piece of advice. Uh, and uh, often when people panic in the market, uh, it doesn't pay back. Uh, you should uh, stay calm and wait because uh, otherwise then you may pay a price. And higher interest in investments in healthcare, uh, biotechnologies and healthcare, because they, I guess, they see where it is heading and the impact uh, of uh, of uh, healthcare and also education technologies. This um, this market is really booming. Uh, it is very obsolete offline uh, in area, and many women start to explore this area. So that's what how I see uh, what I see on the horizon that there will be many innovations happening, and the investments are gearing towards this. But okay, we will see what happens. And uh, another very important thing uh, when it comes to investments, it's not only uh, earmarked for very rich, it is more accessible for ordinary people, investors, and um, it's not rocket science, it's not complicated, and uh, it's not really, you need, don't need to wait or bigger chunks of money. This is one of the principal myths. Uh, you don't need to have thousands of uh, euro on your bank accounts. Uh, uh, often the the amount can be smaller. For instance, 10% when we were uh, talking about this 10%. At the given time, I was talking to a female that became a single mother and she she was like, uh, okay, I need to cancel all savings and everything. And I was, uh, no, 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 stay calm. You really, you really keep it there. You should have a regular saving. So it's a question of one to three years until the uh, her income will change. You never know when somebody gets uh, sick, uh, one will get uh, fired, if, even if you are in the uh, partnership. So I often meet um, women in, uh, in at the maternity leave and they are dealing with a rapid decline in their income. But coming back to investments, um, frequency and regularity is what matters. Uh, when we are talking about uh, women, we're talking about investments. 
it's a long distance run and it's a boring uh, thing for a long run uh, we shouldn't be uh, panicking we shouldn't really um, go for short-term solutions women often think about taking care of their children and they work in the long-term horizon and although we see those uh, rises and falls uh, there was corona crisis and uh, while when it comes to investment 2021 one of the was one of the best years that's number one stop panicking I like numbers and figures. There are statistics. Uh, one of the S&P 500 is the ba um, well-known um, investment index, and we check the daily rises and falls. Uh, there were 251 business days, and uh, we look check the developments, and then we check the highest uh, rise and the highest uh, fall and we uh, crossed out all those that compensate each other then we looked uh, into how many days had a real impact on the performance of the uh, of the investments and markets it was a great year uh, there are few and we found out that only 15 days had a real impact on the performance of the index and the rest was just the media frenzy and the media havoc that had no impact whatsoever on the performance of the markets many conclusions from each and every piece of information that is uh, around us you don't need to make conclusions be it positive or negative many of this information just passes by and have no impact on us has no impact on us and principally if you were not reading the news um, for the whole year and w would just follow the news two weeks before Christmas that would be enough like you know that's a uh, hyperbole but um, so calm down your emotions and the best investors uh, are not only mm, um, considering the the reason but also the emotion if you, when you invest the best investors uh, really have it 50 50 there was one professor who has been lecturing about uh, investments so uh, lifelong Mm, uh, he was very experienced and he started investing and then the first falls uh, were happening in 2008 2009 and although he was lecturing uh, he was panicking uh, all investments companies uh, really mm, need to explore with their clients whether drop in investments by 10 percent uh, if, if it is going to jeopardize them or not many people say no this is this won't be a problem but if it um, really happens many many are panicking I haven't seen my second pillar for a year I know um, what is the, how I set it up I know this product should be there for 20 25 years I, I just need to have it um, structured correctly investments should be boring not because that, that things are not happening but we shouldn't pay attention because immediately once we start uh, being emotional then I know what kind of an impact it has so I've been working in purely female collective and I've been thinking that any sort of decision making where's the rational part or where's the emotional part your balance is uh, shifted m closer towards emotions especially in everyday life in shopping etc etc while we men perhaps tend to tend to be closer to the rational part so uh, perhaps I should when I feel to be too emotional I, I, I try to deal with more facts when I feel I'm dealing too much with facts I start to focus more on emotions and good thing you know and this is perhaps not an advice don't take it as advice take it as my own method of uh, or my, my own decision making method or you know daily decision making methods thank you very much we have very last question here would you be interested in participa participating in a financial literacy workshop? You can uh, click your answer th through Slido. We will not publish the, um, the, the, these answers just for our own you know, information. Uh, 
I'd like to thank very much to our panelists, Zuzana Kedranová from Eura Studio, Terzia Jacová from New Lodge Ventures, Alumus Investment Collective, and Maroš Ovčarik from Partners Investment. Thank you very, very much. This is the very end of the discussions of today. I hope this has been insightful in terms of statistics, viewpoints, and emotions, and impressions. Uh, I see raise hand. Uh, I'd like to thank on behalf of the American Chamber of Commerce for sticking with us until the very end. All the ladies, and I'm ha very happy that I also see quite a few gentlemen, perhaps not as many gentlemen as I wish to see here. Nevertheless, I'd like to thank also to my excellent team for preparing this excellent conference. I'd like to take advantage of the opportunity I have now to thank to two particular ladies from our team who are the brain, heart, hands and, and the head behind this event. This is Christina and Susanna. Ladies, please join me here in front of the stage. Great job. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you. And if I may, I also take advantage of one small comment. Mr. Ofsharik finally explained it to me why we have in our collective three quarters of women and only one quarter of men. And my colleagues are asking for more male hires. So perhaps maybe uh, is, to is to balance out the rational versus emotional side. Uh, one more thing about what we've all heard today. I believe this, this has been insightful, perhaps something new, but very often we seem to be talking within our own bubble, you know, and we are preaching to the converted. So we need more converted, more converts to talk outside of this um, of this uh, bubble. I'd like you to share the recordings of this conference because there's such a long way to go so that all the things we've heard today are changed for the better. Thank you very, very much. Thanks to all the speakers and thank you for the opportunity to be hosting this event. I'm honored. Thanks. And now there's a, a pleasant role for me. I invite you to lunch. Thank you. <laughs>